we're going to switch a little bit, switch gears, and we're going to do something that um, all of the people who put this conference together thought would be very important. It's going to be a veteran speak out. It is, instead of the talking heads here, it is going to be the hearts and souls of the people in the audience. And uh, we want to invite people to speak from their heart, to tell their stories, to express their concerns, to do whatever comes to them, um, because it's now a moment in which um, the lives that you have led and the experience you've had need to be shared with everyone else here. So please feel free to participate, and um, let's begin. Very briefly, I would like to say thank you, Bill, for what you shared this afternoon with respect to the views of power. But I've learned, being a product of not only Mount McGregor, Mount McGregor but a product of injustice is this, about justice. Justice to, to me, and it can be justice for many people in this room, justice is being subjected to another man's power. Because when you subject it to another man's power, they get to determine what your justice is. It's just my opinion, it's been my experience, it's not nobody else's, nobody else's opinion, is that when you're in a disadvantaged position, the worst thing that can happen to you is not to have a voice. And so today we have an opportunity to be a voice for those that are not in power. Those who have sacrificed their very lives and their limbs and their families and their future and their freedom to provide us with those liberties who happen to be incarcerated. So how can any institution stand against that? I think we gather here today, hopefully the cause is not only to make ourselves better, but help making those who are hurting, who need healing better. And that is something that a gentleman by the name of Frank Zaro taught and promoted and content, continues to promote and teach. And that is something I hope each of us continue to do in our lives, not for only those that are incarcerated, those that are in our community. Because it takes a warrior to do that. Now, and speaking about my experience in Mount McGregor and the, and the veterans program, I want to mention to a lot of people who may be advocates for veterans, who may have had the unfortunate experience of being incarcerated. And this gentleman here who spoke about the Opulent program, which was a model program to help make a lot of men better. Men went down the road of self-destruction for whatever reason that they went down. But, I, but I, I am not an advocate for, I'm not an advocate for, for minimizing the criminality of a person who happened to be a veteran just because he happened to be a veteran. Because it's still about self-accountability. If you do a crime, you serve the town. But there's also a problem with that, and I believe some of us may understand that. And the problem with that begins with this. When a person becomes incarcerated, and we wrongfully label that person that has become incarcerated as a criminal. That's where the problem begins. Mm -hmm. Why does it become a problem? Because this individual who is a human being who has broken the law, who may have victimized somebody, unfortunately, still is a human being. And so, until this individual get better, we have laws in place to see that he supposedly get the care that he needed so that he can self-correct, so that we can put him back on the right path. But it's hard to put a person back on the right path when once he is convicted, he is viewed, or his life is viewed as somebody that's undeemable. He's a castaway soul. And that's what some of the veterans face. We talk about the various people who we celebrate as our heroes who do some of the things that we don't want to see them do. It's, like you said, it's about peace today. But what sacrifices are we willing to make for them? Those who have 
blood on their hand that they never wanted on their hand to defend your liberty. Those who are walking around without some life or limb for us to enjoy the, the small privileges that we have, just to have our family, just to have our home, just to drive our car, just to have our cell phones. Some of them who won't be coming home again. I don't think enough is enough of them. And that's what I like to talk about today. And what I mean what I like to talk about today is that this was almost didn't come about. <coughs> but it needs, a dialogue needs to be talked about. And that dialogue that needs to be talked about is to provide more than lip service to individuals that we say that we care about. And we can't provide them with help just simply with advocacy. But we still need a dialogue to go on. <coughs> And what I mean by not only with just advocacy, when I came home, I, I haven't been home very long. They have a lot of programs that set up in place that's supposed to provide us with reentry services, help us with getting res residency, helping us with getting employment, and et cetera. I came home, and if it wasn't for my wife sitting in the back, Mrs. Marcella Patterson, She paid out of her pocket to support me. I didn't have a dime. I didn't have DSS, didn't qualify for DSS. Didn't have Social Security, didn't qualify for Social Security. The only thing that I had was her love and her support. Nevertheless, we have these various new programs. Everybody here, I believe, has heard about the various programs that they had in place because they have a new philosophy now. Alternative to incarceration. I believe that's the new thing that they got going around. <coughs> but nevertheless, like he said, where is all the money going? Where is all the money going? Some of this money needs to get to where it needs to go to help individuals who are trying to make the right decision, who are trying to change their life around, who have to be incarcerated. I ain't saying utilize your time or utilize your money to enable somebody not to hold them in account, because I believe like you, there's a lot of, there, there are some people guilty, and I'll be the first to say, I've been incarcerated a long time, and I never thought I would say, there are some people I wouldn't like to see to get out because they're not trying to get better, they're trying to get worse. And I don't support that. But I have met a lot of quality people who happen to be veterans who are incarcerated, who have made some bad decisions in their life, who don't deserve to be exploited like they're being exploited. There's nobody who wants to be talked about who needs your help, who genuinely needs your help. And there are people here who can help them. And you can help them there by your presence. Not by your presence, not by what you got to give out of your wallet, but by your presence, by being their voice. Reminding them that they're human beings. Helping them regain their honor. Showing them that their life still matters. And that's the only thing that they need. And the last thing I'd like to close with, and I'll share a little bit more, and that is this. The only way that you can have a successful criminal is by the community failures. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it, don't even, it don't only take, today we all know, it don't only take a mother and a father to raise a child. It takes a community. And we know what's wrong, whether it's with the, the prosecutor abusing his power, or whether it's a community that's failing to get involved in their own community problems. But with respect to um, the program at Mount McGregor, I would hope that um, when we walk away from here, that we have people who are able and capable who can get more involved as a volunteer and not get scared away by the institution mm -hmm. to help individuals in conservative transition back into society and help them become better men. Because they're part of our family. That's the only thing I like to say. Who else would like to speak?
Anybody have questions? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Ray Cox, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Um, listening to a lot of stuff, it's really upsetting. Some of which I have personal experience with, some of which I don't. Um, I was uh, a volunteer for a reentry program for guys who are parole coming out of state prisons. And uh, that didn't last too long. Um, but during that time that I was there, I wound up being the interim director because the guy who originated the program got busted for drugs and went back up the river. But this is the kind of craziness that happens, you know. We're talking about like major problems with many institutions. And um, I listened to it and I asked myself, well, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And one of the things I can't do is become part of the problem because I'm so goddamn outraged at things that are wrong. I live in a country that's very violent, where women have to worry about being raped by the people who are supposed to protect them. Minorities, where you're lucky if you can make it to 25 without being murdered. People being railroaded into prisons. And then we got this stuff going on with wars that none of us agrees to, none of us voted on, and they're going on and on and on. I thought when I came home from Vietnam, I thought maybe we learned our lesson as a country. We didn't learn shit. A draft dodger sent the troops in Iraq. They tried to kill my daddy. Jesus Christ, this is a prison. You know, I'm sitting here listening and thinking, well, you know, all I can do is try and have an open mind. And I think it was Einstein who said, you know, we can't solve the problems the mind has created with the same mind that has created the problem. <laughs> you know, and I think in terms of black and white, you know, and I'm trying to see gray areas, and it's just like really confusing. And when Ed was talking about a guy who got put in prison because he murdered an assailant, I'm like, what's wrong with defending yourself? You know, we go and fight a preemptive war for some country where we don't even know the damn people, and somebody jumps me in my own backyard and I can't fight back? There's something very screwy here. You know, so I don't know what good I got to say. I mean, it's just like questioning. It's like, what? You know, what are we going to do? I don't know. You know, we got bureaucracies and institutions, and the only purpose they seem to serve is to perpetrate themselves. Now, that's not to negate the people who are working in there trying to make a difference. But it's hard to see. You know, it's like somebody said before about, I'm against the war, not the warriors. You know, and then one last thing. It's like, when we invaded Iraq and all that stuff went down, I started thinking, you know, I wonder how the average citizen in Germany felt when the Nazis took over. You know? I don't want us to keep on doing what we're doing, but I don't want my brothers in arms getting messed up. What are we going to do? You know, and the only answer I can come up with is change my thinking. Me, change my thinking. I can't do nothing about any of y'all or anybody else. So I just needed to say that. I mean, I thank you all for being here because, you know, it shows that you're concerned at least. You know, and maybe that's a start. I don't know, you know, the 50s, when I grew up, I guess that's one, like, last thing, it's like, you know, I was a product of my environment. I went into the military to solve the problem. You know, and the military became the problem. I don't know. The 50s, you know, it's like prosperity. At the end of World War II, the baby boom, everything, all that crap, you know. Eisenhower was president, and watching the president play golf, everything was peaceful and serene. And none of us knew what the hell was going on behind all that. You know, so, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Thanks for listening.
My name is Rick Herringer. I'm a, a Vietnam veteran, obviously. Um, my ba my background and my enthusiasm for this this conference has been uh, I used to do 12-step service work at Mount McGregor, and um, I'm also a, a volunteer in Soldier's Heart. And before that, I was a Vietnam Outreach Program Coordinator for the Vietnam Veterans of America. And I, I felt a, a special um, empathy, I guess, for the veterans in prison, uh, especially the, the appreciation that they showed me It's obviously still a little hard to talk about. But the isolation that you've heard today that they think that uh, has, has come through in, in uh, some, some of the notes that I've, I've taken down that their biggest influence is being told about what's going on out here in the world by other prisoners, you know, younger guys coming in. Um, that's a little scary. Um, uh, the apathy about being released is a little scary. The PISD, <laughs> post-incarcerated uh, syndrome, um, I, I think that is 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 a a level of of uh, pain and suffering that um, uh, you know from I did I did bid times myself in, in county jails down in, in the state of Florida where where um, you know, anybody who's seen Cool Hand Luke, it still is a real place down there. It's, it's, there, there are places like that that still exist in this country. And, you know, the, the, the frustration that I'm feeling right now is that so many aspects of this, this, this program that we've worked so hard to have some some significant speakers and stuff to that so many people have bailed or or uh, poor Frank has, has got problems that uh, is just mind shattering of how much you know the, the, my sense of, of what's happening is is the prison system is sabotaging everything that uh, we're trying to do here today. And um, so I'm, I'm going to stop with, with that and, and, and answer any questions that anybody might have about Mount McGregor or my experiences there or my experiences as a veteran. There's a question there. Okay, Were sorry. you in that veterans group? I was. I wasn't in the veterans group. I was there before that. I was with the twelve-step program that, that goes goes in there, and, and um, you know, one of the the things that the guy spoke about is that all of a sudden a civilian, um, um, out, you know, outreach of uh, civilians stopped. And it was right around the, the I stopped because when they started asking me to to wear a, a, a mask to protect their prisoners because of, of that that outbreak of, of TB that was going around back in the in the eighties when you know people were dying you know and and. Quite frankly, I got I got afraid for contracting something and taking it home to my family, mm -hmm. and so I you know I 
you know, the, the, the 12 steps we talked about being willing to go to any lengths, and I thought that was pushing it a little bit, you know, so I, 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 I stopped my activity uh, physically, but I, I kept it up um, um, with correspondence with, with prisoners which is another good way to, um, you know, if you, but you have to be on a mailing list with a, with a particular prisoner and, and that can get complicated too, but um, it's, it's, it's a little bit safer than, than, than going into the prison. I was glad that we, we, have, we have one uh, graduate from, from Mount McGregor here. I don't know if he remembers me or, uh, or you were in there in the, around the 1980s, you know. Um, I also, um, I, I, I have some concerns that I've heard about um, um, what's going on up at Altamont House. Um, all of a sudden there seems to be uh, a lot of money that's, that's flowing around and, and that always seems to corrupt things, and, and, and so I've got some concerns about that. I don't know how legitimate that is, but it's it's still, um, um, I know that the Altamont House was, is one of the, the um, step-down facilities for, for Mount McGregor. When you, when you get out of there, you have an opportunity to, to go to Altamont House
got what you think you need. I had my own experience with the criminal justice system, and I'm going to talk a lot about that tomorrow morning. Uh, and I was charged with a lot of serious crimes. Too. And one of the differences between Bill and me is that uh, I was guilty <laughs> of, uh, of all of But uh, it's a long story on that, which I'll explain also tomorrow. But the, um, the thing that, that he brought out, and I think is important in terms of these uh, conversations, is that you know, there are a lot of good cops and there are a lot of good prosecutors, but the institutions, my experience, both from being within the system and also being a lawyer, is that um, they are not designed for, in, with the primary interest of justice to all. They're primarily designed to arrest people and get credit for arrests and to convict people and get um, uh, credit for convictions. And if the person happens to be innocent, well, that's too bad. Um, and there isn't much of a recourse. In prosecutorial immunity, we have very liberal discovery rules in the state of Washington. The, the kind of stuff they withheld from you, they would not be able to do in Washington at all. But that doesn't change the primary motivation of what is going on and how investigations are done. And you see this over and over again. I, I was talking to a couple of people during the break. Um, I represented a guy one time who came home for lunch from work, found his wife tied up to the bed. Uh, she had been raped, she had been stabbed, and half of her face was blown off with a shotgun. This guy's aunt and uncle who had raised him um, had been killed in a car accident about a month before that. And when he came out of his house, he said, my God, Uncle Jeff and, and Aunt Sarah, and now my wife, what have I done? And you know, he was in a state of shock saying, like, what did I do to deserve this? And a neighbor heard that, the police heard that, and immediately said, he did it. He's guilty. And they went on about a month-long investigation of uh, um, talking with people, interviewing people who had known him before, taking arguments that he and his wife had had, and piecing those things together to try to build this case, eventually brought him down to the police station, interrogated him for about four hours with things like, you know, these things, most of the time when these things happen, people just black out. They're not even sure what they, what they did. They don't even remember it. Yeah, but they have really good reasons, you know. And that sound like maybe something, that, and this guy's still in a state of shock after finding his wife, and, and he's thinking, I don't know, I don't know, maybe. And um, finally, he had a good sense to walk out of there. But they were getting ready to charge him. And uh, within, day or two before they were going to charge him, the, uh, the actual murderer got pulled over in a traffic stop, and the shotgun and some bloody clothes were found, and then they went ahead and arrested this guy. The point on this is good cops and good prosecutors gather facts, evaluate all the facts, and then they draw conclusions. What happens too many times is that they draw conclusions and then they start going out and trying to pull in the facts that will support that conclusion. And trying to get them off of it is almost impossible. It kind of gains its own momentum in doing that. And the other thing, you know, I asked Bill about did they offer him a plea, is if they start thinking, oops, we, got, we did something wrong here, our case isn't very good, then they want to protect themselves from civil liability. And so if you plead to something, then they can then that precludes you from bringing the case later on. So my hat's off to you, Bill, for not doing it. I mean, they'll offer you any felonious overtime parking. Just plead to anything, because it protects us. So uh, anyway, like I said, tomorrow morning I'll, I'll give you some more stories. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody have any questions for Paul?
Yeah, what state of Washington do you come from? Washington, D.C. or Seattle, Washington? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Washington State. Washington State. Yeah. Out there on the Pacific. Works like this about nine months after. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I, I tell you, I live in a town called Vancouver. So when I tell people I'm from Vancouver, they say, oh, you're a Canadian. And I say, no, I'm from the first Vancouver. I'm Washington. I go, Washington, I love the Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> so usually I just tell people I'm from Portland. <laughs> 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 